Welcome to The Porch. My name is Jacob Hayes. Thanks for taking some time out of your day to listen to my thoughts on the sporting events of the past week, as well as anticipation for the ones to come. If this is your first time tuning in and you want to know more about the podcast, please check out my introduction episode that discusses the layout and expectations for the podcast. And if you want to keep up to date on any of the podcast uh, episodes of the future or any inside information, please check out the social media pages on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, as well as the YouTube channel. For the inaugural episode of The Porch, we're going to take a look at my favorite player, Stephen Curry, and his unfortunate missed return, why he missed it, and what to look forward to for the rest of the season for him and the Golden State Warriors. We're looking at the MVP race highlighted by LeBron James and Giannis Antetokounmpo. We'll also be taking a look at the college basketball scene. There was only one week remaining before we get into conference tournament and then selection Sunday. And then I'll wrap it up with some talk about the NFL Combine, my personal highlights for the entire event, and then we'll finish it up with my excitement for baseball as spring training begins. So to kick it off, uh, might as well start my very first episode with my favorite basketball player, Stephen Curry. Uh, It's been really unfortunate not to see him play this season due to the broken hand he suffered at the beginning of the season. Um, His projected return date was March 1st, and Steve Kerr and the Warriors organization held him out of the game against the Washington Wizards. doesn't have to do with the bone healing, but rather the nerve damage that took place and the continued healing for that. The issue with that is... Of course, it's, it's his left hand, so not a shooting hand. But when it comes to ball handling, which is something Stephen Curry is well known for, it's difficult to dribble a basketball if you have a hard time feeling the basketball in your hands. So it's definitely a bummer, but I really want to see him healthy. And if that means that he doesn't get to play this season and we'll wait it out to the next season, so be it. Uh, I definitely miss watching him play. And uh, I thought it would be fitting that the king of threes would be our leadoff topic for today's date, March 3rd, the 3rd of March. Three threes, if you you didn't didn't catch that, all all the threes there. Speaking of the Warriors and really all tanking teams, there's really an interesting dynamic that happens with tanking teams that we've seen recently, and I want to talk about it, specifically looking at the Golden State Warriors. What do organizations do when the season is basically gotten a loss? And of course, you can tank and get your absolute, in, in the NBA, your best odds to get the number one overall pick, or at least get into that top three or four. But what can we learn from those last games? Like, what are organizations trying to do to prepare themselves for seasons to come? I think what the Warriors have done, they're using a strategy of basically these really small contracts with forgotten NBA players. I think it's fantastic. And so I want to go over some of the players that the Warriors have either signed to a 10-day contract or a two-way contract and talk about their importance to the Warriors now and how they can be played into the future of this team, and how you can maybe see if your team's tanking too, <laughs> um, how you can see your team doing that as well. So the first player, and also you'll kind of recognize this as, as we go through, I would be very surprised if you knew any of these players' names, and that was kind of the idea. I didn't know many of these players' names before uh, I saw that they had been signed to a 10-day contract, so I wanted to do a little research on them and uh, look at some of their skills and how they can help out the Warriors in the future. So, first one, Juan Toscano Anderson. Um, he is a, a small forward, power forward. He actually came from Castro Valley High School in California, which, a uh, little fun fact about myself, I actually raced at their high school uh, when I raced for Pioneer High School. And so I got to see the, the canvas that he played at. I actually remember... Um, stepping into their gymnasium, so which is where he played uh, all of his home games, which is kind of cool. Uh, he then went on to play at Marquette University for the Golden Eagles in the Big East. He went undrafted in 2015. He played in the Mexico Professional League, and then he signed with the Warriors G League uh, this last summer. So he's been brought up, and he's been playing decent minutes at uh, the, the small forward power forward position. He's been sitting along there with Andrew Wiggins, the most recent Warriors pickup. And I can see him being as maybe a backup to Andrew Wiggins, of course, we'll see Clay Thompson fulfill the shooting guard role, which is kind of what Andrew Wiggins is is doing right now. Um, so as a backup, I can see him playing well. He he's has pretty good intensity on defense, and so far I've liked the way he's played. Uh, but really unique, though, that he's undrafted, and this is his first uh, team in the NBA that he's been signed with. Oh, very exciting. Uh, second player um, is Dragon Bender. Um, <laughs> 
funny story about this guy. And just when I was doing some research on him, his name, his first name is spelled D-R-A-G-A-N. He's from Croatia. And when I first read it, I just I just read Dragon Bender. And I think that's hilarious. And for all intents and purposes from here on out, his name is not actually pronounced Dragon. I am going to pronounce it Dragon because it's funny. Uh, so Dragon Bender. I mean, come on. Like, imagine, <laughs> come on, Dragon Bender. Like, that's awesome. So <laughs> Dragon Bender. So really a fascinating player. This guy is seven foot one. Okay. That's not, that's not someone that the Warriors have on their roster right now. They don't have anyone over the seven foot mark. And if you look at someone like in the past, like JaVale McGee, really tall dynamic centers that have the ability to shot block and make it difficult for people to finish around the rim have had beneficial value, especially going in late to the playoffs where they can fill in spot minutes here and there and really shut down players on the opposite end of the floor and he was someone that was kind of expected to do that, but also he's just incredibly dynamic. What's really cool about him, he was the fourth overall pick, actually, to the Suns in 2016. And uh, he's teammates with Marquise Chris, which is someone that we'll pick up next uh, when he was on the Suns. He went to free agency last year, signed with the Bucks, and then he was waived by the Bucks, where the Warriors picked him up on a 10-day contract. I, I love this signing. This is my, probably my favorite signing of the ones that we're going to go through. Um, not just because I like his name, but I, I think this is someone that the Warriors can really develop and make into a special player. And you know, the 10 days might be enough. They might drop the project, move along. But I really think this is someone that the Warriors can invest in after their centers right now, which would be um, Marquise Chris. Again, we'll get to him later, and Kevon Looney. I really think his size has huge impact on the Warriors. I think the Warriors should really use uh, a bench presence like him. And I think, I mean, he was the fourth overall pick in 2016. So not to be be understated he's a very dynamic very talented player and uh picking up a player like that that's just kind of forgotten about that you can call him a bust and turning him back into something that's special i think is a great use for him other player i mentioned marquise chris he was drafted by the kings and traded to the suns on draft night and he he was bounced to the rockets in cleveland and eventually he signed a two-way contract with the warriors he's only 22 okay that's the first thing i want to mention right now he is legitimately the starting warrior or he's the starting center for the warriors um, it would normally be Kevon Looney. Kevon Looney's out with an injury, but man, has he filled in great minutes for the Warriors. I have loved the way that he's been spaced on the floor, the way he rebounds, the way he does pick and rolls, um, put back dunks. I've been very impressed with him, and I can guarantee you actually that the Warriors are going to extend him. He is definitely going to be part of the Warriors' future. Steve Kerr has praised him, and he's been my favorite pickup that the Warriors uh, have done this season. Um, last three players here, Michael Mulder. Uh, he was from Canada. He played in the Canadian professional league there, and he just signed a 10 day contract with the Warriors after being released by the heat just a few days ago. Um, just another play that the Warriors are testing. See, is this guy any good? I mean, he was picked up by the heat. He'd have been looking for some more bench presence. You know, that's why they made the trade with Andre Iguodala at the trading deadline, pushing their way into, um, to the postseason, and so they said, well, Michael Mulder's not going to fill the spot that we think Andre Godala is, is going to, so I'm excited to see what he turns into, um, and he hasn't played any mini- meaningful minutes yet. He played only in one game. He had 17 points in that one game, but um, we'll see where he goes from here. I don't have enough sample size on him to really know exactly what I feel about him, but again, anything that the Warriors do, you got to be at least somewhat excited about, especially with how their season has gone. Kai Bowman, or Bowman, my apologies, Kai Bowman out of Boston College. He's been with the G League for the Warriors for quite a while. He has been basically playing for the Warriors all season, off and on, especially after Stephen Curry's injury. And I like him. I like his intensity on defense, really. I think that's the big thing. His on-ball defense, um, I think there's a lot of similarities to Patrick Beverly and his intensity, his desire to get steals, to make it difficult for the offense to be ran. I think players like that are really undervalued in the NBA. I like players like that. Um, of course, you have really elite ball handers, but just making it difficult every single time on the floor. He plays full court defense, every possession, and I love that about him. I hope the Warriors give him a second look and uh, extend him into the future. And the last guy is guy, literally, they just signed him just a few days ago. Um, Chasson Randall, he graduated from Stanford. He's bounced between a few teams, uh, Wizards, Knicks, and 76ers. He also signed a 10-day contract. And we'll see what he turns out to be as well. Um, Again, he hasn't played a game yet, so we'll see. But the idea is that the Warriors are picking up players really, I think, as as a way of extending their G League, right? So you have your G League, which is a group of players that you're 
You're working out, testing to see if they can play in the NBA. And they're just like extending the G League into their actual NBA games. Can these players play? Give them a second chance. See if we can revive these guys' careers. Because I mean, what else are you going to do with uh, your season that you've only won 13, 14 games in? Right? Just trying to prepare for the future. And I think the Warriors do a good job at this. They're pulling players that I think can see success in the future. I'm most excited about Marquise Chris. I mean, he's by far, I think, the best player out of the ones mentioned. Uh, and then, of course, Dragon Bender. <laughs> I just I just love that day of Dragon Bender. I, I'm not going to get over that. Um, and I really hope that he sticks around as well and that the Warriors put a lot of time and effort into him. But that's enough talk about the Warriors. Um, they're bad, so <laughs> it's kind of hard to spend time on them. Let's get to the two, I think, personally, I think, the two most fascinating players in the NBA right now and their battle for the MVP that would be LeBron James from the Los Angeles Lakers and Giannis Antetokounmpo. Oh, I don't think I pronounced his last name right, but you know, Giannis, <laughs> the Greek freak out of the out of Milwaukee, the Milwaukee Bucks. So comparing the two, LeBron and Giannis, and uh, also the the rest of the field, uh, whoever other players that might be James Harden, Luka Doncic. Comparing the two, I'm going to go over the pros and cons of LeBron and Giannis, and ultimately make a decision on who I think would be um, my MVP. So, starting with LeBron and his pros. Crazy stat. I, I love this. I think it really speaks as a testament to the type of player LeBron James is. So, currently, and most likely he's going to finish with this stat, he leads the NBA this season in assists. This is LeBron James' 17th year in the league. No one in the history of the NBA has ever led in a stat category in their 17th year, and LeBron's doing this with assists. Okay? Also put it in perspective, John Stockton, the current um, record holder for most assists in a career, he led uh, the NBA in assists in his 12th season and never did it again afterwards. So LeBron, who has never led the league in assists, in his 17th year, really developing into the point guard position for the Los Angeles Lakers is leading the league in assists. That's, that's incredible. I, it just really, again, it speaks to the type of player LeBron is his willingness to play different positions to make sure that his team can win. And also just speaks to how good of a ball handler and passer he is. He has great court vision, uh, which uh, that's fantastic. Uh, to pair along with most assists in the league right now, he's scoring 25 points and 11 rebounds, and he's averaging about eight assists. He's shooting 49% from the field. So he's sitting pretty. Uh, some cons for him. He plays with another superstar who could possibly be getting votes, uh, and that would be Anthony Davis. So uh, he has a player that's put, in, put next to him that's playing really incredibly well, and uh, Anthony Davis could be stealing votes for him, so it would, that would make it harder for... LeBron James to capture that MVP title. And um, that's kind of it, honestly. Um, and if you, uh, it's, not, it's not really many cons. Uh, the only issue is that if you come across Giannis when you're comparing stats, and this is where Giannis's pros come into play, Giannis is averaging 30 points a game with 14 rebounds and six assists. And that, I think, is overall a better stat line than the 25, 11, and 8 that LeBron is averaging. So other things uh, for Giannis to back up his MVP case, his big stat is his PER. So PER stands for player efficiency rating. Giannis has the highest player efficiency rating ever. But he, he has the highest player efficiency rating in the history of the NBA this season. That means he was better than any year Michael Jordan played, any year Magic Johnson played. Any year LeBron has played, any year that Kareem played, Wilt played, Shaq, Kobe, right? You, you list them all. Larry Bird. Giannis right now is the player with the highest efficiency rating in all of the NBA. And uh, that number for him is 32.36 currently. And that it fluctuates a little bit based on the game, but um, that's far and beyond the best number out of anyone who's ever played. In comparison, if you look at LeBron's player efficiency rating, he's at 25.69, so a full seven points down. And to put it in some more context, Anthony Davis, LeBron's teammate, he's at 28.14 and is fourth in the league. So that's crazy. 
Um, and also to help out uh, Giannis's case is he doesn't play with another All Star. Uh, I'm uh, actually my apologies. He doesn't play with another superstar. I, I just, Chris Middleton is not a superstar. He's definitely an All Star. He was on the All Star team. He's a great player. I'm not going to deny that. Chris Middleton is not a superstar. Not in the same way that Anthony Davis is. Anthony Davis is by far a top five player in this league. Chris Middleton definitely is not. So, um, if you look at the field, you know, like James Harden, Luka Doncic, Jason Tatum really kind of put himself to the conversation of late. I uh, can even look at like maybe Kawhi Leonard, um, Nikola Jokic. There's there's other players out there that have compelling cases to be the MVP, but I personally don't think any of their arguments are strong enough to beat out either or uh, either LeBron or Giannis. So with that being the case, uh, I'm not going to spend any extra time on that. If I had to choose my MVP right now today, I think it's got to be LeBron James. Um, and I'm playing a little bit into the storyline feel. Um, and you can look at Giannis' stats, and it, they're incredible. Um, I think James Harden, or not James Harden, oh my gosh. I think LeBron James is playing in the diff- the the more difficult conference. right? So you have Giannis leading the East. He has the best record in the East. Uh, LeBron James is leading the West and has the best record in the West. Uh, I think everything that happened with Laker Nation, Kobe's death, um, the ramifications that that organization felt, and the way that LeBron James has kind of stepped up and played some fantastic basketball through it all, um, I think that deserves to be recognized, especially because he's doing it in his 17th season. And um, I know that's not like a truly purely objective way of looking at it, especially when you're looking at stats and the amount of wins that the Bucks have and the way that Giannis influences his game with how efficient he is. Um, I would pick LeBron. I, that's who I would vote for. Um, I, now, honestly, I would be. I think both of them are well-deserving, so I'd be happy if either of them got it. Um, and I, I, no one else is it's going to be one of those two as the season kind of is coming down to the its, uh, its final stretch here. It's between those two who's going to win the MVP. But personally, if I had to choose today, I am picking LeBron James. And I I do actually think that um, he will win the MVP this year. Continuing on with basketball, but just looking at the collegiate side, I'm going to go over the top 10 Division I men's basketball teams uh, from last week, week 17. And I'm going to, you know, just talk about their games and figure out why those teams are ranked in the top 10. And then give it a little analysis of what team I think right now is going to win the national championship outside of any tournament seating. Um, eventually, when we get to Selection Sunday, I'll be making my final picks uh, for March Madness. But for the meantime, let's look at Week 17. So if you're looking at rankings right now, March 3rd, you'll be looking at Week 18. They released a uh, the AP poll released a new rankings for Week 18 on Monday. I'm going to go back a week, look at the rankings from that week and how the games of last week progressed to get to the rankings that you see right now. So week 17, your top 10 teams starting with number one, Kansas, two, Baylor, then Gonzaga, Dayton, San Diego State, Florida State, Duke, University of Kentucky, Maryland, and Creighton. Those are your top 10 teams. So if we look at At those teams, um, when we have two from the ACC, right, you have Duke and Florida State, uh, just one from the SEC, University of Kentucky. Um, You got Baylor and Kansas from the Big 12, which is uh, exciting for for them. Dayton out of the Atlantic 10. Creighton out of the Big East. San Diego State out of the Mountain West. And Gonzaga out of, I think they're just out of the West Coast. I think it's called the West Coast Conference. I think that's right. Um, So, um, things to note, really Duke had a rough week, uh, Duke lost in double, I think it was double overtime. Yeah. Double overtime to Wake Forest. That's going to definitely be a, a hard mark on their record. And they're going to definitely drop out of the top 10. They also lost to Virginia. Um, it was a close game uh, ended with an incredible block for uh, Virginia to win it. So Duke will be definitely be out of the top 10. I think they're going to get replaced by Louisville. Um, even though Louisville lost to Florida state earlier in the week, they had a great win later on. I think it'll bump it up. They'll either be at the 10 spot, maybe a little bit higher. Creighton on Sunday had, or uh, not Sunday, or maybe it was Sunday, Saturday, one of those two days, had just a rough game. Um, 
it was Sunday. Uh, they lost to um, poorly ranked St. John's. St. John's is sitting at like 4-12 and 12 in the Big East, and St. John's is beating them by 20. That's not going to look good for Creighton, and I expect them to drop out of the top 10. And I actually I think they're going to get replaced by another Big East team, and that would be Seton Hall, which won both of their games. Um, outside of that, uh, Maryland played well. They'll probably stay around the same spot. If Duke drops out, yeah, the two teams I expect to bump in over Creighton and Duke are Louisville and Seton Hall. Games to look forward to in the future that I'll be covering for my next podcast. Um, these are games that if you have the chance to watch them, I would definitely watch them. They have huge implications for how the conference standings are going to go for each of their leagues and also how they're going to go with the seeding line. Uh, these games down the stretch, especially ranked games, uh, will have influence if a team is on a, a four line or a five line or um, maybe on the bubble and suddenly not being in the tournament or not being in the tournament and then making their way onto the bubble. So the first game I want to mention um, of significant importance is for mention Seton Hall, and they're going to be facing Villanova. That's on Wednesday. Um, it's a huge Big East matchup. The Big East is just stacked. They are fantastic for not being a Power 5 conference. They have lots of teams that really have a chance to make their way to March the March Madness Tournament. Um, that's a big one. I personally like Seton Hall to win that game, although I would not be surprised if Villanova's shooting uh, overpowered Seton Hall. But um, Seton Hall is a team that I think legitimately could win the national championship. Not my pick for this week, but um, I do pick them to win that game. Another game, Dayton and Rhode Island. Rhode Island's been on a bit of a skid. Um, but that is a, a huge game. If Rhode Island wins that, that really puts uh, their at-large bid chances of going way up. I expect Dayton to win that game, and ultimately I expect them to win uh, their conference. That's the Atlantic 10 conference. Um, if Rhode Island wins that one, that's huge again for their at-large bid. Um, if they don't win that one, they're definitely pushing that bubble and could find themselves looking from the outside in. Those are both games on Wednesday, March 4th. Going ahead further to um, Friday, uh, no, my apologies, Saturday is March 7th, uh, big game um, in the ACC. So Louisville, forementioned that I think is going to be in the top 10. They're going to face Virginia, who has been an, on an absolute tear. They just recently beat Duke. Um, this is going to be huge for seeding when it comes down to the ACC tournament. And uh, the better Virginia does... Uh, the better chance they have themselves of getting an automatic bid, which a few weeks ago just did not seem very likely. So that's a good game to watch. Uh, Virginia has just been playing really well of recent, and I will definitely be tuning into that one. Also on Saturday, another Big East matchup. I I, I might be a little bit biased to the Big East, even though uh, the Pac-12 is the league that I root for. I love the teams there, mostly because they're they're really good and they're not in a Power 5 conference, I think. Uh, Seton Hall again, but this time they play Creighton the team that just lost to St. John's. So another huge matchup. Um, you're going to expect that one to go down to the wire. I could definitely see Creighton winning this game. Uh, and I think that would be an upset of Seton Hall. Um, Creighton's shooting has just been lights out of late, except for the game at St. John's. Uh, that's going to be a great one. I'm actually going to pick Creighton to win that one over Seton Hall. And as for the, the Virginia-Louisville game, I'm going to pick Louisville to hold on, but I would not be surprised if Virginia really slowed down the pace. They're a really slow, grinded out ball game, or ball club. Um, so watch for that game. And also on Saturday, for a little bracket watch, a little bubble watch, um, my Stanford Cardinal will face off against the Oregon Ducks. It's going to be in Eugene. Uh, Stanford is on the bubble. They're um, probably for most people on the outside looking in. They're going to face Oregon State or Oregon this week. Oregon right now is ranked. Um, I assume they're going to stay ranked into this week. Uh, if Stanford can win that game, uh, though I think it, it won't happen, that would pretty much guarantee that they're in. And so that's a game I'll be watching for my personal self. I think it would be a really good game. Uh, last time they faced, uh, it happened to be that uh, Stanford upset Oregon, uh, and that was in Palo Alto. So good game to watch there. And lastly, going in on Sunday, three Big Ten matchups to watch on Sunday. Michigan, Maryland. Uh, Michigan has been bouncing around a lot. Maryland has stayed tried and true. Um, I like Maryland. I'm going to pick them to win that game. Um, and they're one of my teams that I definitely have. I think they could definitely win a national title. But again, not my pick for this week. We'll get to my pick later. Uh, Ohio State, Michigan State. Can Tom Izzo beat the really the, the Ohio State team that's just been on a roll. 
Uh, Ohio State just recently beat Maryland. So that's a game that I am definitely looking forward to watching. And then to uh, round out that day, Iowa, Luca Garza, possible player of the year. Uh, they're going to take on the Fighting Illini of Illinois. Um, I'm going to take Iowa to win that one, and I'm going to take Michigan State to beat Ohio State for those three Big Ten matchups. All of those have huge implications for the seeding for the Big Ten tournament. And as for my team, to take it all, um, just for this week, I uh, even though I didn't mention them in any of the games to watch, Kansas has looked incredible the way that they have uh, played against, um, against Baylor and against the rest of the Big 12. They look like the team to beat this year. I've been very impressed with their uh, their inside play around the rim, the way they shoot the three ball, the way they play in transition, and their team defense. They are playing just fantastic. They had the most quad one wins out of any team in college basketball. Um, it just they're they look they look the best right now, and um, that could change. You know, have a rough performance in the Big Twelve tournament, maybe an upset with Oklahoma or another one of those lower teams that's in the middle, also maybe on the bubble. Uh, and I might be picking a new team. But right now, if I had to choose, I'm choosing uh, the Kansas Jayhawks to win it all. Okay, so now jumping into the NFL Combine. I'm just going to go through a few players that I was personally impressed with and how well they competed and, and worked hard for the NFL Combine and really showed out. Um, I don't watch it live, and I don't know every single player that goes through, but I like watching the highlights that NFL throws up. And um, these are the players that struck me as the most impressive. So first one, out of Iowa, offensive tackle Tristan Wirfs. Okay, this this I'm actually just off the bat. This is my favorite player. Just what he did at the NFL Combine was absolutely incredible. Okay, so he's 6'5", 320 pounds. He ran the 40-yard dash in 485. Okay, so that's first and foremost, that's the best and fastest time for any offensive lineman in attendance there. He was the fastest one on the day. Okay, so he's... This is a 320-pound man who ran 40 yards in 485. That is incredibly impressive. Just just that side alone. And sometimes it's kind of hard to see if you, if you don't watch it. Um, I did retweet it, so you can see it on the Twitter. I, I mean, he just looks... He looks way too good um, to be running that as an offensive tackle. He just looks so good. I'm very impressed with that. Okay, then, after that... He posts a 36.5 inch vertical jump. Okay. You want to know who else jumped a 36.5 um, vertical jump? DeAndre Hopkins, Jerry Judy, wide receiver out of Alabama. CD Lamb. Okay, CD Lamb didn't even jump that high. He only jumped 34 and a half inches. Amari Cooper, he jumped 33 inches. Okay. So this offensive tackle who weighs 320 pounds out jumped some of the best wide receivers either out of um, this year's NFL Combine. And then Jodrick Hopkins, I mean, he's the best wide receiver for the Tex- uh, the uh, goodness gracious, Jacob, uh, the Texans. Uh, Houston Texans. There we go. Uh, so that's that's just incredible. Um, I mean, he also outjumped A.J. Green. Uh, A.J. Green only jumped 34 and a half inches during his NFL Combine. Again, he jumped 36 and a half inches. He's 320 pounds. I just, I was very impressed with him overall. I mean, what a wonderful performance. Just fantastic. Really, I mean, really. Just fantastic. Duffy deserves a lot of credit. I hope he gets the press that he deserves because I was just so impressed with how, with how, how I mean, honestly, with how well he did. Fantastic. Uh, next player, uh, Jonathan Taylor. So, Jonathan Taylor, he was in the Heisman running, uh, running back from Wisconsin. He ran an incredibly fast 40-yard dash. I think he was fastest among running backs for... Um, the combine this year, I I think he's going to be underrated going into this draft. There's not like a ton of really high tier running backs, and uh, I think he's going to be a pretty darn good NFL running back. The way that he moves, he has really good speed. He's lying on his feet, and um, I think he's just I think he's just underrated. I think he's underrated. So keep your eye out for Jonathan Taylor out of Wisconsin. Henry Ruggs the third. Wide receiver out of Alabama ran the fastest time on the day. I think four two eight was his um, forty yard dash. Um, I mean, his speed is just unmatched. And you're looking at like Marquise Goodwin speed, and uh, it's just <laughs> he just when you when you when he's running down the stretch and you're just watching him move, it looks so effortless. And if he can learn at how to run routes as crisp as possible for the NFL, man, he is going to be a dangerous wide receiver to look out for. 
Isaiah Simmons, linebacker out of Clemson, he had a fantastic day. He, he just looks so athletic. He's so fast. Um, just his ability to uh, track the ball and track the people he needs to tackle, he is incredible. I really like how he did. And the last person I want to mention, not actually a player, but uh, someone who I kind of means a lot to me and just me starting this podcast and what he did is Rich Eisen. So he has his own show called The Rich Eisen Show. Go check him out. He doesn't know that I'm doing this, but, you know, of course, he's far bigger than I am. doesn't really matter. He's awesome. Rich Eisen. So what he did is he also runs the 40-yard dash. He's over 50, and he does NFL analysis, of course, with his own show. And he does it all for charity. And this year, he was donating to St. Jude's Research Hospital. He raised $816,000. Really just fantastic work. And, um, of course, it's funny. <laughs> it's funny to see an over 50-year-old man running down the straightaway in a suit. Um, and of course he has his, you know, these really cool cleats, whatever that are all decked out for his show. And, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a fun, it's, it's a spectacle, but it really kind of shows where his heart is at. And, um, that's one of my favorite parts. It, it really is just him going out there uh, for charity. And that, that was really special. So, uh, go check him out in his show and the analysis that he does. I really like what he does. So Rich Eisen, as for the QBs, uh, Justin Herbert threw, I thought he threw really well. Uh, as did Jalen Hurts. Um, he's kind of been forgotten about uh, for QBs. I mean, a lot of people are asking him to try to transition to a different position. He was like, no, I'm going to be a QB. Um, so of the, like, really the five QBs that I'm most interested in, Joe Burrow, Tua Tungavailoa, Justin Herbert, Jordan Love, Jalen Hurts. Now, Jalen Hurts isn't going to be a top five prospect. He won't be the fifth overall QB drafted, but those are just the five I'm interested in. Um, it's exciting. And uh, for the future, I'm actually going to rank those five and how well I think they're going to do in the NFL. And if I was um, the Cincinnati Bengals, who have the first overall pick, who I would personally be drafting of those five. And then some of the teams are what I think they should draft. Um, so that's exciting for the QBs, but that'll be for a future episode. So nope, that's all for the NFL Combine. Just a few little touches. Again, go check out Tristan Wirfs and his incredible uh, 40-yard dash the vertical jump. And also he did a broad jump. I didn't mention that earlier. He did. Uh, I think he tied best overall in the history of the NFL combine for the broad jump. So he had an incredible day. Go check out the, uh, the tweet that I retweeted um, on the podcast uh, social media accounts. So uh, last thing I want to talk about is spring training and the beauty that baseball is back in the air. Baseball is my, personally my favorite sports. Um, it's a sport I grew up playing the sport I grew up watching and listening to on the radio. So uh, it's fun to listen to um, players just getting back into the grind of things. Uh, it's fun uh, watching here at George Fox, the baseball team. They're playing really well right now, and I get to write for them and just bring some excitement back. If you have a chance to go out and watch a game this summer, um, find your local team and, and go on and watch a game. And it may not be at the, the major league level. You might have to go find maybe the AAA or AA affiliate, whatever's in your local town. It's just fun to go out, enjoy a hot dog, enjoy the warm summer, and and watch some baseball. I'm really excited about it. Just the feeling in the air, the smell of it, being on the field, it's special. Um, and I'm just excited. I really want to, uh, I really want to go watch some games. I'm looking forward to uh, watching some Giants games when I uh, return back to the Bay Area after school's over. And uh, I'm of course looking forward to watching George Fox and the rest of the season that they have here. As a little recap for them, right now they're six and zero in conference play. They swept. Uh, Pacific Lutheran, and then they went and swept Puget Sound. So they're playing incredible. They're ten and two overall in the season. Um, they're just they're playing great. And uh, so you have a chance if you want to go read the recaps on the George Fox website. Um, I've written them all, and so would love the support if you would go look at them. And and I, honestly, if you have critique like how to write them better, please send it my way. I'm always looking to get better at the writing that I do there. So um, that's all for today. Thanks for tuning into the porch. Um, I rambled, I think, a little bit too much on the uh, the NBA and, and the Warriors and all their 10-day um, deals that they did with these random players. But uh, I think it just brings up an interesting idea about how teams that are tanking go about how they deal with their season. Uh, I hope the MVP race conversation was good. Give me your thoughts about who you think the MVP should be in the, MB, uh, in the NBA, if you think it should be LeBron, Giannis, or someone else. If you think one of the players I left in the field I, I didn't think had a – Good enough argument. If you think one of those players should have been it, let me know. 
As for the top 10 college basketball picks, I just went off the AP poll. That was the top 10. If you disagree with that poll and you want to throw in another team that you think can win the national title or a really underrated team, let me know about that. And let me know about the NFL Combine if I missed somebody that you thought just had an incredible day uh, or someone that we should be looking out for in the future if they get drafted into the NFL. So thanks again for listening. Really appreciate all the the support. Follow those social media accounts. That's where I can let you know uh, when I'm updating um, the show and when episodes are going to be released. So thanks again for tuning in. Keep making it happen. Thank you.